video will focus on Golden Hollywood star Kay Francis. I hesitated to make this video because the subject, Kay Francis herself, was explicit about wanting to be forgotten. But her life was so remarkable and interesting, I feel the need to make this video and tell her story. Catherine Edwina Gibbs was born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma Territory in 1905, the only child of Joseph Sprague Gibbs and Catherine Clinton, May Francis, an actress. Catherine Clinton was born in Chicago in 1874 and was featured in newspapers with a stock company at the Orpheum with her young daughter Kay. Wed in 1903, her parents split in 1909 when Kay's mother divorced her alcoholic husband and took Kay with her on the road. Kay inherited her height from her six foot four inch tall father and at five feet nine inches was one of the tallest of Hollywood's popular 1930s female lead actresses. Unfortunately, her father's alcoholism had an impact on the young Kay, and she would find herself pursuing inaccessible men due to the input her father had on her. We can see Catherine Clinton was a hard scrabble actress in the Edwardian era here. Her mother had been, Kay's mother had been born in Nova Scotia, Canada, and was a moderately successful actress and singer. She often traveled with her mother. Kay attended Catholic schools when it was affordable, just like Joan Crawford, becoming a student at the Institute of the Holy Angels at age five. After attending Miss Fuller School for Young Ladies in New York in 1919 and the Cathedral School in 1920, she enrolled at the Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School in New York City to train to be a secretary. While there, she did nothing to discourage the assumption that her mother was the pioneering American businesswoman who had established the Gibbs chain of schools. In 1922, 17-year-old Kay was engaged to James Dwight Francis, a well-to-do man from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Their marriage at New York's St. Thomas Church ended in divorce three years later in 1925. By 1928, Francis had remarried local Massachusetts girl Leslie Frost Ballantine, and he married a third time to Henrietta Craig Rossiter Long in 1936, who eventually moved to Michigan. He attended Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, and attended Harvard University. He served as a pilot in World War I. So Kay was not only Kay Francis through her mother's maiden name, but through her first husband. Her next husband was also older than her, just like James Dwight Francis. In the spring of 1925, Francis had gone to Paris to get a divorce. While here, she was courted by Bill Gaston, a former athlete at Harvard and member of the Boston Bar Association and a potential former classmate of first husband, James Dwight Francis. Secretly married in October 1925, their marriage was short-lived with only occasional visits between Bill in Boston and Kay in New York City following her mother's footsteps onto the stage. They divorced in 1927. Bill then married another actress, Rosamond Pinchot, on January 26, 1928 in Westchester, Pennsylvania. They had two children, William Alexander Jr. and James Pinchot. They were married almost 10 years, but sadly Rosamond committed suicide on January 24, 1938. Then Big Bill married Texas beauty Harriet Lucille Hutchings, more commonly known as Lucy. They eventually divorced. He then married Teddy Getty Gaston, ex-wife of oil baron John Paul Getty. They had one daughter, Gigi Gaston. William died on August 30th, 1970. He was cremated and his ashes were scattered on an island in Penobscot Bay, Maine. He does have a marker on the island, but it is private and inaccessible to the public. Kay made her Broadway debut as the player queen in a modern version of Shakespeare's Hamlet in November 1925. 
She often borrowed wardrobe for fashionable nights out in New York that were reported on by the day's press. This was not uncommon for actresses at the time. Louise Brooks would often do the same thing. Frances claimed she got the Broadway part by lying a lot to the right people. One of them was producer Stuart Walker, who hired her to join his portmanteau theater company. She soon found herself commuting between Dayton and Cincinnati, Ohio, and Indianapolis, Indiana. She played wisecracking secretaries, based on her knowledge of secretaries from secretary school, saucy French floozies, walk-ons, and bit parts. By February 1927, Frances returned to New York after her French divorce and got a part in the Broadway play Crime. A teenage Sylvia Sidney had its lead, but later said, Kay Francis stole the show. After her divorce from Gaston in September 1927, she became engaged to society playboy Alan Ryan Jr. I found an Alan Ryan Jr. who became a professor in the 1950s. I'm not sure if this was the same one. She promised his family that she would not return to the stage a vow that lasted only a few months before she was playing an aviator in a Rachel Crothers play, Venus. Frances appeared in one other Broadway production, Elmer the Great, in 1928. Written by Ring Lardner, produced by George Cohen, and starring Walter Houston, the play flopped. You can see Walter Houston's impressive acting ability on film opposite Joan Crawford in 1932's Reign. Houston is a member of the Houston, Houston acting family, today including Angelica Houston. Though flat broke at the time, Frances was unwilling to ask friends like Houston for help and determined to crawl out of this mess herself. Houston was very impressed by this and impressed by Frances's performance. He encouraged her to take a screen test for his new studio, Paramount Pictures, and the film Gentlemen of the Press of 1929. Paramount offered her a starting contract of $300 per week for five weeks. She made Gentlemen of the Press and the Marx Brothers film The Coconuts at Paramount's Astoria Studios in Astoria, Queens, New York before moving to Hollywood to continue her Paramount career. Signed to a featured player's contract with Paramount Pictures, Frances created an immediate impression. She frequently co-starred with William Powell, first teaming in Street of Chance in 1930, when David Selznick fought for their pairing after seeing Frances briefly in Behind the Makeup. The pairing worked, and they appeared in as many as six to eight movies together per year, making a total of 21 films between 1930 and 1932. You can learn more about Powell in my video about his sapphire gifts to his favorite ladies. Frances's career flourished at Paramount in spite of a slight but distinctive speech tick. She pronounced the letter R as W, which gave rise to the nickname Wavishing K. Francis. She appeared in George Cukor's thrillingly amoral comedy Girls About Town in 1931. On December 16, 1931, Frances and her co-stars opened the newly constructed Art Deco Paramount Theater in Oakland, California, with a gala preview screening of The False Madonna. The Paramount Theater is a 3,040-seat Art Deco concert hall in downtown Oakland. When it was built in 1931, it was the largest multi-purpose theater on the West Coast. Today, the Paramount is the home of the Oakland East Bay Symphony and the Oakland Ballet. It regularly carries lecture series, classical music, blues, pop, rock, gospel, jazz, and screenings of classical movies from Hollywood's golden era. It cost $3 million at the time to build over six years under the hand of San Francisco architect Pfluger. In 1932, Frances's career at the Paramount changed gears when Warner Brothers promised her star status at a better salary of four grand a week. Paramount sued Warner Brothers over the loss of one of their best actresses. 
Warner Brothers persuaded both Francis and William Powell to join the ranks of their stars. After her first three featured roles had been as a villain, Frances was given roles with a more sympathetic screen persona, such as in The False Madonna, where she plays a jaded society woman who learns the importance of hearth and home when nursing a terminally ill child. After her career skyrocketed at Warner, she was loaned back to Paramount for Trouble in Paradise in 1932. From 1932 through 1936, Frances was the queen of the Warner Brothers lot, and her films were developed as star vehicles. By 1935, she was one of the highest paid actors, earning a yearly salary of 115 grand, dwarfing the 18 grand Betty Davis, who would one day occupy Frances' dressing room maid. From 1930 to 1937, she appeared on the covers of 38 film magazines, second only to child sensation Shirley Temple. Soon after her arrival in Hollywood, she began an affair with actor and producer Kenneth McKenna, whom she married in January 1931. McKenna's Hollywood career floundered, having spent more time in New York with the couple's amicable 1933 separation, they divorced in 1934. McKenna biographies are quick to point to his second wife, Mary Phillips, as his true soulmate, which seems to do a disservice to Kay. McKenna was supported in part by MGM studio bosses due to his family connections, his father being a rabbi. Kay was the much better actor and McKenna remained behind the scenes with scripts and storylines. When they divorced, the press stated the two remained the best of friends. Kenneth McKenna was the classic example of the firstborn son, says his biography. On reaching manhood, he felt that it was his duty to take care of his entire family, mother, father, and siblings. Responsible, intelligent, and clear-headed, he was constantly setting up strategies for his family as if he knew instinctively what was best, and he was usually right. This is a contrast to Kay Francis, who had to support her mother, but did not consider herself a strategist by any means. Kenneth's devotion to his second wife, Mary Phillips, and to his brother, Joe, as well as to Joe's adopted son, Michael Mielziner, continued until his death and then beyond. His own professional success as a story director with MGM allowed him to help support his brother's career give generously to others, and contribute to the theater. Frances frequently played long-suffering heroines in films such as I Found Stella Parrish, Secrets of an Actress, and Comet over Broadway, displaying to good advantage lavish wardrobes on her tall frame that in some cases were more memorable than the characters she played, a fact often emphasized by contemporary film reviewers. However, in the 1930s, reviewers acknowledged that her performance had reticence and pathos, and she even achieved glowing reviews from the New York Times. In October 1937, Frances met aviation businessman Raven Freiherr von Barkenau, Barnacow at a party of Co Countess Dorothy Dentici de Frazzo in Beverly Hills. In March 1938, gossip columnist Luella Parsons reported on their intended marriage and that Francis would retire from films, but by October the two were traveling separately and Francis was still acting. By December 1937, Barnacow had returned to Germany. Barnacow was born in 1897. He was a German World War I flying ace credited with, credited with 11 aerial victories. He lied to Francis when he met her and claimed he was the heir to a mining fortune, when in reality he was working on diesel motors at GM. He had helped fund the Luftwaffe in Russia in 1924. While posing as a wealthy businessman, he borrowed $1,300 from Francis and she paid off two grand of his debts. Despite this, Francis really loved him. Barnacow settled in San Francisco in May 1939 after traveling to Germany in 1938. He was suspected of being a spy. 
to shield him from being interned as an enemy alien when World War II broke out, which the American government did to many foreigners, Frances proposed marriage and retirement to Hawaii. It was over her protest that Barnacow returned to Germany in September 1939 and eventually shot himself or was killed in a hunting accident in 1941. Francis's clothes source reputation and statuesque frame often led Warner's producers to concentrate resources on lavish sets and costumes for her, rather than the quality of the storylines, a move designed to appeal to many suffering in the Great Depression who could not afford a lot of clothing. Eventually, Francis herself became dissatisfied with this approach and openly feuded with Warner Brothers about the injustice of this even threatening a lawsuit against them for inferior scripts and treatment. This led to her demotion to films such as Women in the Wind and in 1939 to the termination of her contract. Kay Francis kept private diaries for most of her life. This is an excerpt of one from 1938. My life? Well, I get up at a quarter to six in the morning if I'm going to wear an evening dress on camera. That sentence sounds a little gaga, doesn't it? But never mind, that's my life. As long as they pay me my salary, they can give me a broom and I'll sweep the stage. I don't give a damn, I want the money. When I die, I want to be cremated so that no sign of my existence is left on this earth. I can't wait to be forgotten. In May 1938, before her contract was termination, the Independent Theater Owners Association paid for an advertisement in The Hollywood Reporter. This included Frances, along with Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford, Fred Astaire, Mae West, and Katharine Hepburn, on a list of stars dubbed Box Office Poison. The Independent Theater Owners Association were being dwarfed by the studios and struggling. This was their call for help. This advertisement read in part, the combined salaries of these stars take millions out of the industry and millions out of the box office. We are not against the star system, but we don't think it should dominate the production of pictures. We want the Myrna Loys and Gary Coopers and Sonia Hennies, but we want them when we get value, not when they drive people away from the box office. So afraid are the studios of losing a star, they tie them up for many years with the result that stars continue to receive top salaries far after their box office rating slides. Kay Francis, for instance, is still receiving many thousands a week from Warners on an old contract. Yet so poor is her draw, she is now making B pictures. This bad press hurt her. After her release from Warner Brothers, she was unable to secure another studio contract. Carol Lombard, who had been a supporting player in Frances' 1931 film Ladies' Man, insisted Frances be cast in her film in name only in 1939 as the villain. Frances had a supporting role to Lombard and Cary Grant, and it offered her an opportunity to engage in some serious acting. After this, she moved to supporting parts in other films, often playing fast-talking professional women holding her own against Rosalind Russell in The Feminine Touch, for example, and even played mothers opposite rising young stars such as Deanna Durbin. Frances had one lead role at the end of the decade opposite Humphrey Bogart in the gangster film King of the Underworld, released in 1939. Frances was in the role of a doctor who is forced to treat Bogart's injured gangster character and then gets caught up with the law Originally titled Lady Doctor, by the film's release, Warner Brothers had again changed titles to King of the Underworld, while demoting Francis to second billing. With the start of World War II, Francis joined the war effort, doing volunteer work with the Naval Aid Auxiliary, where she was named head of a hospital unit. She also performed extensive war zone touring, first chronicled in the book Four Jills in a Jeep, written by fellow volunteer Carol Landis. It became the popular 1944 film, Four Jills in a Jeep. Mary Pickford wrote to Kay in 1940, 
congratulating her on her work for the Women's Committee of the Motion Picture Division of the Red Cross. Pickford was the chairman of the board. By the end of 1940, Kay's health was beginning to show signs of alarm and she had a hemorrhoid operation in December. You can learn more about Mary Pickford and Joan Crawford's relationship in their video on my channel. In 1941, with a hectic work schedule and social life, Kay told her diary that I must get off the merry-go-round. It doesn't appear as if she did, as Thanksgiving of that year was spent with Cary Grant and his wife Barbara Hutton. In mid-1941, she sold her house and spent most of her time with the Motion Picture Production Defense Committee in California. Her old friend, Walter Houston, had not forgotten about her, unlike her ex-husband, McKenna and Houston dem demanded her as his leading lady top build in his first movie for Warner Brothers, Always In My Heart. In 1942, despite success throughout the previous year, Kay remained unhappy. Crying all night, she told her diary, hell of a new year, no plans, I guess I am a pretty stupid, unattractive person. Wonder if I will live the year out, hope not. Carol Lombard, one of Kay's closest friends and co-star in Ladies' Man and in Name Only, died in a tragic plane crash in 1942. Kay made no mention of this in her diary, but decided to leave the screen and aid the war effort in Lombard's memory. She turned down all offers until her return to the screen two years later in Four Jills and a Jeep. At the end of the war, Four Jills was given a four-star production by 20th Century Fox, but still needed distribution through Monogram, and the decade found Francis virtually unemployable in Hollywood due to the year-long script delay on Four Jills in a Jeep. This was incredibly painful to Kay. She had lost one of her close friends. She was trying to do the right thing by volunteering and emphasizing Carol Lombard's uh, charity in Four Jills in a Jeep, and the studios insisted on fighting over it. She signed a three-film contract with Poverty Row Studio Monogram Pictures that gave her production credit as well as star billing. The resulting films from Monogram Pictures, Divorce, Wife Wanted, and Allotment Wives, had limited releases in 1945 and 1946. She remained desperately lonely and turned to throwing pool parties at her ho new home, having sex with Larry Fox in the pool itself after all the guests of one party had left on an evening in July 1942. She began her affair with Otto Preminger, noting that he wasn't that great of a lover in the beginning but made improvements over the following weeks. Otto Preminger was younger than Kay, born in 1905, he was an Austrian-American theater and film director, film producer, and actor. He directed more than 35 feature films in a five-decade career. He first gained attention for film noir mysteries such as Laura in 1945. At the time of his affair with Kay, he was married to his first wife, Marion Mill. Preminger probably wouldn't have finished Laura if it wasn't for Kay. Tensions on the set of Laura were at an all-time high when Reuben Marmoulian and Otto Preminger, both of whom were lovers of Kay's, refused to speak to each other. Marmoulian eventually le left the picture to Preminger, who completed the film himself, and it remains a film noir classic. In 1942, Kay developed laryngitis after a USO North Africa tour and had to be hospitalized. She started 1943 with influenza and a torn ligament, and she closed it with a kidney issue. She starts physically distancing herself from her pool, refusing written requests from service members to swim in it. In 1944, her affair with Otto Preminger came to an end when he caught her in a lie. After trying to call her, she told him that she was at the Mo Cambo. In reality, she was intimate with another man, Tim Howard. Preminger told her that he had searched the Mocambo for her with no result. Kay's affair with Tim Howard ended when he returned to Washington, D.C., but she ended up sleeping, him, sleeping with him again mid-year and another man whose wife she knew and thought highly of. A doctor ordered Kay to stay home after realizing she had a fractured rib. This is likely when she started receiving prescriptions for more pills than she knew what to do with. 
she refused to stay home and traveled to Seattle for more tours of veteran hospitals. By the end of the year, she had caught gossip columnist Hedda Hopper's attention and was quieting down, which Hopper approved of. In 1945, she spent the year vacationing in the Caribbean, South America, New York, and Las Vegas while working for the USO. In 1946, she told her diary of a new habit of hers, com combining pills and alcohol. She begins living in the Hotel New Weston of New York. Through her whole life, Kay visited her mother regularly, and this is noted in her diary. In 1947, with her new lover, Howard Happy Graham, beside her, she watched Morris Chevalier perform at the Henry Miller Theater. The year ends on a sour note, however, with Kay paying legal fees to bail Happy out of jail after he hit Rudolph Duro, a 22-year-old who had wanted to show Kay photographs from her African USO tour. Duro ended up dropping all charges. In 1948, Kay wrote her January activities down in her diary. Shopping, early dinner, after show, all hell broke loose and me too many pills. Newspapers covered the story of how Kay Francis almost lost her life. Her lover slash manager slash traveling companion, Howard Hap Happy Graham, had discovered her in her hotel room in a semi-conscious state. When the police arrived, it was discovered she had taken a lethal combination of pills and scotch and was covered in third-degree burns from her knees to her hips. She had been suffering from a cold, and Hap followed doctor's orders by giving her fresh air, propping her up where she accidentally burned her legs against a hot air register. To make matters worse, he had poured hot coffee on her neck. Both were heavily intoxicated, and he was charged with hurting her, but these charges were dropped. She underwent several surgeries to repair her burned skin within the next few weeks and remembered chronically crying to her diary. In 1949, she toured the country with various stage plays, including The Last of Mrs. Cheney, which her former co-star William Powell would act in the film version. Kay rang in 1950 by celebrating William Powell's 61st birthday. She met her old friend at the 21 Club. In 1951, she lost the part of Sadie in Somerset Mom's Rain. She broke her toes, and this is Rain, the television version, not the film version with Joan Crawford. She broke her toes and underwent a surgery she never explained. At the time, she had a 14-year younger lover who was married, and so some biographers have wondered if she got an abortion during this year. She did vacation in Mexico for two weeks, and Mexico was a common medical destination for abortions, divorces, and other surgeries. In 1952, TV host Ed Sullivan expected Kay to appear on his variety show. He had planned a tribute to Kay who backed out because of fear. The tribute was canceled as a result. In discussions with Betty Davis that year, Kay Francis reiterated that she didn't give a shit how abusive Jack Warner was to her because she just wanted the money. In 1953, Kay's diary entry for New Year's Eve, which detailed her evening, turned out to be the last one she ever wrote. After 32 years, Kay Francis stopped writing in her diary for reasons unknown, although it is possible that she wanted a transition and a change. In 1954, she unintentionally ended her stage career with a performance of theater at the Grove Theater in Lake Nuangola, Pennsylvania. Her final performance had her making an unusual exit. When the play ended, she got down from the stage, walked up the aisle, greeting all of her fans along the way, and exited through the theater doors in the main lobby. In 1955, she was spotted with her heavy topaz jewelry. Kay was wearing a huge bib necklace with a five-inch bracelet to match. Goldie Hawn complimented her with a southern accent saying, what pretty beads. The beads were genuine rubies and topazes, over 50 of each in the necklace alone, and worth a ransom. In 1956, Kay considered a return to summer theater. 
In 1957, Kay's beloved mother, Catherine Clinton, died, age 82. Before her death, she wrote a heartbreaking letter to Kay. My precious babe, I want you to know what a wonderful daughter you have been, but really, darling, I never thought I'd live on so long to be a burden to a very smiling child. I have loved you always more than anyone in this world, but you know that. I wish I could have left more as you have given so much, but a very great many things have unexpectedly had to be done and I have tried to keep the place in good condition for you to dispose of as you see fit. I have no debts and the only bills will be the monthly ones. I wish I could have been of more help to my one you lamb, but just remember me a loving and devoted mother. When Kay cleaned out her, her mother's home, she discovered about 29 scrapbooks filled with clippings about Kay, stretching back from about 1923 all the way to the date of her mother's death. Her diaries, Kay's diaries, which are preserved along with film-related material in an academic collection at Wesleyan University, is open to scholars and research and these often paint a sad picture of a woman whose personal life was often in disarray. But one has to dig deeper and see that Kay Francis was part of the machinery of Hollywood, keeping it moving pre-war, post-war, able to transition from movies to the stage. Francis regularly socialized with gay men, one of whom, Anderson Lawler, was reportedly paid 10 grand by Warner Brothers to accompany her to Europe in 1934 to keep her out of mischief and potentially report on any Nazi-related activity. In 1966, Francis was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent a mastectomy, but the cancer had already spread. She died in 1968, aged 63. Anxious to be forgotten, she wanted neither services nor a grave marker. Her body was immediately cremated, and according to her will, her ashes were to be disposed of how the undertaker sees fit. Having no living immediate family members, Frances left more than $1 million to the Seeing Eye, an organization in New Jersey which trains guide dogs for the blind. No one really knows how she found out about the seeing eye. It may have been during her hospital visits when she was living in New York. It may have also been on her USO tours that it was an organization that struck her as a really good one as she interacted with American veterans. I could not have made this video without the impressive material on kfrancisfilms.com and findagrave.com. Those are two really incredible websites with a boatload of research. If you are looking for a great K. Francis film and want to see the woman in action, I recommend all of her films with William Powell and also Cary Grant. It's clear that these co-stars thought very highly of her and you really see her shine on stage.